Yeah. 
the little children sang through pillar court and temple the lovely anthem rang to Jesus who had blessed them close folded to his breast the children sang their praises the simplest and the or you may add it to the decorations. <clears throat> Nothing is saved. There's no uh, secret uh, meaning to where you sit. There's no danger in sitting in a chair with a cloak on it. Uh, you're not, not going to have to put it on, not going to have to act anything out. It's, it's representative of the cloaks that were thrown on the road before Jesus and following Jesus along with the palm branches. So on this cold, rainy, snowy, sleety first Sunday of spring break, Sunday, welcome to all the mighty, hearty, uh, faithful of you who are gathered here this morning on this Palm Sunday. Thank you for processing in and, and joining us in being part of the parade, <clears throat> the Palm Sunday parade this morning. Now that we have, are here <clears throat> and have a chance to um, take a breath, we're going to do that as we move further into our special time of worship this morning. First of all, before we do that, I want to thank Joyce Haven uh, for all of the work that she has done to create this scene, to create this space, the donkey there and the, 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 the colt, the donkey, uh, along with the symbols of the covenants that we've talked about and all of the, all of the cloaks. Joyce, thank you for creating this atmosphere of festivity and remembrance. So as we move further into our time of worship, uh, since we are just now sitting down, I do invite you to take a couple of minutes to take some deep breaths, to become a little more fully present here in this space with one another and in the presence of God. And I, I want to say again, oh, we didn't light our candles. I want to say again that we acknowledge God is present in all the places of our lives, in all moments. But there can be something about gathering in a space like this, a church building, a place of worship uh, with one another that helps us to be more mindful, that may allow us to be um, more present, more aware of God's presence with us. So we're going to take a couple of minutes. I invite you to do what you need to do to become a little more centered on being in this space.
I'd like to invite Jennifer now to come forward and lead us in our opening words. When God appeared on earth in the person of Jesus, most of the world did not recognize him and therefore did not worship him. Today we ask for faith that will open our eyes to see Jesus for who he is, that we might worship him in truth. People of God, behold your God. We open our eyes to see his glory We open our ears to hear his wisdom. We open our hands to offer him gifts. We open our mouths to sing his praise. We open our hearts to offer him Lord. He is Lord. Hosanna. Our song for gathering this morning is number 199, Filled with Excitement. And I invite you to stand and sing with either a hymnal, if you have one or need one, uh, or with the words here on the screen, and um, sing with as much excitement and enthusiasm and energy as you can. I invite you to stand as you're able. Let us pray. It is relatively easy for us to call on someone to get palm leaves and to spread them in the church today. And we can easily find music and a few good words to help us remember and reenact Palm Sunday. But what if you arrived and 
invited us to really lay down something important to us to acknowledge your arrival? What if we knew the imminence of the danger that accompanies you or sensed that the authorities were watching as we worship? How then, Jesus, would we meet you today? And what would we spread before you? And how would we regard each profound humility from the one we hope will save the world? Palm Sunday, Jesus, help us to see how and where you enter our world today and what you ask us to lay at your feet and how we may truly welcome you in. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. And now Joyce has some words for our young and young at heart disciples. You may be seated. Hi, Philip. How are you? Good. Is it snowing outside? Yeah. I kind of wish it wasn't. I'll be driving later. But I want to share a few things with you. <clears throat> see here. I'm going to start. Have you, have, do you know what a parade is? If it shows up here, please be nice. Have you been to a parade up in Los Alamos or in White Rock? A parade, here we can look. A parade is when there's people marching down the street. We might have marching bands or um, other things and people stand along the side of the road. And there might be what they call floats, people pulling something. Who's that in that picture? Is that Woody? Yeah, Woody. Someone important or someone special. In the fall, the, the high school has their homecoming parade, and they have a special person that rides, and we all stand on the side of the road, and we wait. And then little kids like you, you know what they do in those parades? They throw candy at you. Would that be cool? Kids come with bags to because they are going to get candy. But let's see. this, and then also, next slide, Joseph. Now, um, some parades, you'll have horses. Horses are really tall. Horses are very proud. And on this particular day, we talk about a parade that was different. Kings rode on horses. People said that Jesus was their king. But Jesus did not come riding into the city on a horse. He came riding on a donkey. Doesn't a horse look far more impressive than a donkey? And the other thing that was different was Instead of people expecting candy to be thrown at them, they took off their cloaks. This is sort of looks like something that the people wore, and they put it down on the road so that Jesus didn't have to walk on the road. Or they took these, the palms that we carried in, and they laid them down because a king shouldn't have to walk on the dirty, dusty road. They laid down their own garments and palms, and they stood on and waved flags and shouted for him. I think, next one's Joseph. Next one after that, please. I think this is what it sort of looked like. The people stood on the road and they go, Hosanna, which means king. He, here's the one who comes in the name of the Lord, and he's our king. He's going to save us. And they even bowed down in front of him. That's not like the praise we had today. Jesus was a different king, a different leader, and that's why lots of different things. We should always celebrate important people. And as long as we make sure and worship Jesus, 
that is a good thing. Can you pray with me? Dear Lord, thank you for bringing all of us together on this cooler than expected morning. We still shout hosannas for the moisture that you give us. May we remember that how you walk through a city and lay down things for you, precious things for you, and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Want two more? So let us join now in singing for uh, Philip and for all of us, Jesus Loves Me. Thank you, Joyce. I was hoping you were going to be throwing candy. <laughs> so now in the context of our remembering and claiming and singing God's love for all of us, for all people, for all of God's creation, uh, we move into a time of confession, a time of uh, uh, examination, time for us to be honest before God about ourselves and the state of our hearts so that we can then move more fully into a state of forgiveness. So I invite you, I invite you to join me in singing our prayer, praying our way, singing our way into this time of forgiveness. After that, I will ask you to join me in the Palm Sunday litany of confession that you will find in your bulletins and on the screen. So let us sing our way in. The streets were crowded, people shoulder to shoulder. A parade mood filled the air, everyone jostling to see. Shouts came from young and old, from deep in the heart. Hosanna, save us. Save us, almighty God, from lukewarm, half-hearted faith. Hosanna, save us. Save us, O Christ, from callous indifference and detached insensitivity. Hosanna, save us. Save us, Holy One, from too safe hopes and too small dreams. Hosanna, save us. Save us, Jesus, from unquenchable greed, stirring us to want more, more, always more. Hosanna, save us. Save us, eternal God, from damaging lazy habits and easy faithless commitments. Hosanna, save us. Save us, Lord of lords, from soft-mindedness and a lack of courage and hard-heartedness and a lack of compassion. Hosanna, save us. O oh God, we cry from the depths of our hearts, the very pit of our souls, and the center of our beings. Hosanna, save us, O oh Christ. Save us now. Amen.
tell the daughters of despair, proclaim it to the sons of sadness, Christ has come to save us. Thanks be to God who comes to bring us grace, hope, life. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. And now as people who are forgiven by God, may we also experience some of God's peace. We're going to sim, sing our hymn, Peace of God Be With You, which again I want to lift up as if you're looking in the hymnal and I think is also on the screen. Uh, those, the words to this hymn are written in Hebrew, Arabic, and English. And so I invite us to keep in mind all of those peoples, all of the peoples of the world um, as we sing this hymn of peace. I invite you to stand as you are able and sing, and as you do that, to greet one another with some sign of the peace of Christ. be seated. <clears throat> we pray for illumination. <clears throat> Eternal God, <clears throat> whose word silences the shouts of the mighty, quiet within us every voice but your own. Speak to us through your word. In these words heard and spoken, and through the thoughts and meditations of our hearts, that by the power of your Holy Spirit we may receive grace to show Christ's love in lives lived in your way of love. Amen. We're going to hear... Uh, the reading of the word from uh, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, you know this story, and I know you just stood up, but let's stand again if you, uh, in body or spirit uh, as uh, we read from the Gospel. Uh, Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem, at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately, immediately, as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say, The Lord needs it and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. And as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it. Uh, they threw their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And he entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, 
as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. So this morning, we're going to move away from the theme of covenants, uh, but not speak about it directly, to focus on the events that we are commemorating uh, for on this Palm Sunday. And so with that in mind, I want to tell you, I want to share with you part of a conversation that I had with my son Ryan a week or so ago. Ryan, as you all know who are gathered here, is in his second year at Colorado State University in Fort Collins. I was asking Ryan how he had enjoyed his spring break, which had been the week before, and he said he'd had a really good week. Some of what he had done I knew about. He went to Miami and he took a surfing lesson, and I knew some about that, but he told me um, that he'd spent the first weekend with his friend and housemate Tommy snowboarding. I hadn't known that, and I thought that was great because they hadn't been able to go much this winter. So he said they had driven to Steamboat Springs, which is about three hours from Fort Collins. Tommy's family has a condo there. And Ryan said, I thought you'd be interested to know that we spent about an hour and a half of that trip talking about religion. And I said, like all of you, I said, really? <laughs> and Ryan said, yeah. And he continued and he said, I told him I didn't really know what I believe. And he told me that Tommy is a Christian and that they talked some about what Tommy believed. And, and I said to Ryan, did you tell Tommy that your mother is a pastor and she's never really talked with you very much about that? And he said with a laugh, yeah, I did tell him that. And he said, you haven't ever really told me very much about what you believe. And I said, I would love to have that conversation with you sometime, Ryan, if you are, are interested. And he said, I would like that. Mm -hmm. So I've been thinking about that. And as I considered today's passage, I wondered if in that conversation with Ryan, that, that hasn't ha happened yet, but I'm looking forward to, would I say to him that I think of Jesus as king? that Jesus came to usher in a new kingdom. Because it seemed to be clearly part of the faith of the people who gathered that day in Jerusalem, this day that we're talking about and remembering, the people who very excitedly, as we did today, welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem as he came riding into the city on a colt, on a donkey. A choice by the way, that he seemed to make deliberately. In part, perhaps, and likely, to draw people's attention or their memories to a particular prophecy that had been made in the book of Zechariah, a prophecy that these people who were devout Jews would have been familiar with. A prophecy which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. They would have been familiar with that. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious, humble and riding on a colt. And here comes Jesus into Jerusalem, humble and riding on a colt. Surely these people are expecting the rest of that to be true, the triumphant and victorious part. Here he comes, I can imagine them thinking, just like Zechariah promised, humble and riding on a colt. Here's our king, the king that we've been waiting for, the king that our people have been waiting for for generations. He's coming, he's here. He's the one we've been hearing about, healing and teaching and feeding the hungry all over the place, all in the name of God. He has come in the name of our Lord. He 
is finally here. He's our king. Finally, we'll be free. No wonder they were excited to welcome him. No wonder they were throwing their coats down on the ground, as I learned, had been done in a coronation ceremony for at least one king in Israel's history. No wonder they were waving palm branches and laying them down on the road before him, again, as I, had, I learned, had been done at the time when Jerusalem had been conquered and the Jewish temple had been reconstructed. So these were historical acts they were doing. Their day had come, finally. How could they not be excited? They must have thought, finally, we are going to be set free. Finally, we're going to be set free from those who have oppressed us for so long. This Jesus is the one. He's the one who's going to save us. And in Mark, as, as Jennifer read, we hear, and they went ahead of him, and they followed after him, and they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The reality, of course, as we know now, that they didn't know, is that Jesus was headed not for a coronation, but for an execution. Those people who were gathered that day, celebrating his arrival, rejoicing in his coming reign, excitedly welcoming his saving presence among them, they didn't know this. But he did. He knew it. He knew that his death was coming. And I want to share some words with you that I found uh, from a commentator who is a professor of New Testament at Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary in South Carolina. He said, not that Jesus's mission per se was to die. Rather, Jesus knew that his unbridled approach to human wholeness had proven too disruptive and too offensive for those wielding power. Jesus chose death because toning down God's healing love to avoid death was not an option for the Messiah. Jesus could only love at full speed and Jesus knew that this same love would overcome death itself. I love that. Jesus could only love at full speed. And toning down that love was not an option. Doing anything other than living fully, fully within, from within God's love was not an option for Jesus. Even with the unshakable knowledge that that would lead to his death. Because again, in the words of that commentator, Jesus' unbridled approach to human wholeness had proven too disruptive and too offensive for those wielding power. With full awareness that it would cost him his life, Jesus would not, and maybe could not, do anything other than remain living completely centered in and oriented around God's love. God's healing love. This love that sees us and accepts us fully with full and deep awareness of our woundedness. This love that calls us back time and time and time again from our places and spaces of estrangement and separation. This love that offers time and time and time again to restore us to true and right relationship with God, which then opens the possibility of us being restored to true and right relationship with ourselves, which then leads to the possibility of us being restored to true and right relationship with those around us and with all of God's creation. Jesus would not 
and maybe could not live outside of that love. Jesus will not and maybe cannot turn away from that love. That love, God's healing love that Jesus makes available to all persons in all moments, at all times, in all places, regardless of their status in society or lack thereof, regardless of their wealth or lack thereof, regardless of their education or lack thereof, their religious training or lack thereof, regardless of their gender identity, their ethnic background, their racial heritage, their language, regardless of anything that we use as humans to define ourselves and one another. That love is the love that Jesus lived at full speed, only at full speed. And he did it knowing that it would cost him his life. He did it to the point of his death. Because, again, as the commentator stated it, Jesus knew that this love would overcome death itself. He knew that this love is more powerful, is bigger, is broader, is deeper than even death. He knew that this love that is God, God's love cannot be stopped or squelched or defeated even by death. And this love is what Jesus offers that sets us free from the things that bind us. This love is what Jesus offers that saves us from our own woundedness. This love, God's healing, reconciling, truth-telling, relationship-restoring, peace-giving, courage-imbuing, fully embodied, whole, W-H-O-L-E, making, whole making love is at the core of the kingdom or kingdom, as some prefer to say, or the reality, as I like to say, of God. And that is what Jesus reveals and invites us into or maybe invites us back to. I do not believe that, it's, that that reality can only be experienced in and through Jesus. I don't believe that. But as a Christian, I do believe that it is made manifest in Jesus in a very particular and a very full and unique way. And in response to that, I can join my voice with all those in all times and places who say, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. I will let you know what Ryan thinks when I share that with him. And I would be curious to know what you think. Amen. I invite you now into a few moments of stillness for your own reflections. invite you now to stand as you are able in body or in spirit and join in our hymn of response 
Number 196, another Palm Sunday hymn, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. You may be seated. Hosanna. Let us affirm our faith together. And I believe you have an insert. <clears throat> we believe that God is present in the darkness before dawn. In the waiting and uncertainty where fear and courage join hands, conflict and caring link arms, and the sun rises over places of struggle and walls topped with barbed wire. We believe in a with us God who sits down in our midst to share our humanity. And we affirm a faith that takes us beyond the safe and comfortable places into action, into vulnerability, and sometimes into the streets. 
We commit ourselves to work for change, starting with ourselves, to bear responsibility, to take risks, to live boldly and courageously and risk humiliation, to see and stand with those on the edge, to choose life and to allow ourselves to be used by the Spirit for God's new community, hope, peace, and love. Amen. So we have an opportunity now to move into a time of sharing prayers. We will begin with our sung prayer in a moment. Uh, I want to mention now the prayers that are lifted up on the board because I have a special Palm Sunday prayer that I will be uh, offering without naming those specific prayers. So of course this morning we continue to hold in our prayers the Ukraine, what is happening in the Ukraine. Um, <clears throat> and also, it's not on the board, but we certainly keep in prayer uh, the, the terrorist act that happened in Moscow and the people that were killed and the people that are still missing and the people that are recovering, everyone who was affected by that act. <clears throat> we pray for the situation, the war in Israel and Gaza. Um, and pray for peace, pray for uh, peace in that region. We pray for the Sudan, the conflict there, and in all places in the world where there is, so many places in the world where there is violence and war. We pray, continue to pray for Jean's daughter, Sean, and her re ongoing recovery, and for Jean's trip, upcoming trip, to be with Sean, and for Jean's birthday that was yesterday. Uh, we pray for uh, Travis, a young man in California uh, who was recently badly injured. We continue to lift up Sam Elson and uh, his wife Sonia as Sam um, is in a treatment um, trial, a trial uh, for his cancer. We lift up, continue to lift up George and Joyce as they continue to live with and deal with health concerns. We lift up our neighbor Abby and her family. We always and continue continuously pray for our siblings at the House of Fellowship, in particular for Pastor Fred and Lorraine as they continue to minister to uh, their flock and the surrounding communities tirelessly and faithfully. We lift up Gil and Louise George and Jeff uh, as Gil continues his radiation treatments. And we pray this week in particular, um, as this weekend is the beginning of the local spring break, we pray for travel mercies for all who are traveling, <clears throat> including Joyce, who will be traveling today. <clears throat> And there are many things for which we also give thanks, including this land on which we gather and the people who stewarded it for us for so long before we were here. And for all who celebrate birthdays, including my son Ryan, including Jean, and including Jennifer, whose birthday is coming up this week, and others. So certainly all of those things we uh, offer in prayer and keep in our prayers. And so as we have already moved into a time of prayer, I do invite you to join me in singing our, um, our invitation or our, our um, maybe basis for our prayers this morning. Nothing can trouble.
God of celebration, what a joy it is to not only remember, but to celebrate Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. The disciples gathered the colt for him to ride, and people shouted praises to God for all that Jesus had done, waving palm branches and placing their cloaks in his path. Even when some were cautious, Jesus reminded them that the stones would sing out if they who were cautious did not. For triumph was truly coming to the holy city. Triumph and victory, but in a way none of them could even imagine, through agonizing pain and suffering. And to agree that a degree that none of them would ever fully understand salvation and healing for the entire world. So we, God, on this day wave our palms and sing and shout our praises because we too have seen Jesus at work in our lives and in the world. And we too have seen God at work in Jesus. God, we pray that Jesus would ride in victory into all the places of tension and anger, both in our lives and in the world. We pray that Jesus would come in triumph and heal the hurts in our hearts and lives and heal the hurts and divisions in the world. We pray that Jesus will enter our lives anew, entering into our hearts and the world with fresh power and glory, and in so doing, establish the reign of God's peace and healing and reconciliation forever. This parade that we remember and celebrate is a good thing not to be discounted as silly or inconsequential or irrelevant. God of life, we need to shout with joy and let those shouts ring in our hearts. Bring us hope, gracious Lord, where we have allowed fear and confusion to reside. Bring us healing, O God, where we have been wounded and have wounded others. Bring us peace, Holy Lord, where we are bombarded with anger and alienation. Bring us with you, we pray, into the holy city that is your heavenly realm, brought to earth wherever you are present. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our voices now, almighty and eternal God, as we lift our hearts and pray together the prayer that your son, this one who was greeted as king and who we celebrate today, as he taught his disciples and continues to teach us today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite Bob up now, who has a moment for mission to share with us. This is something uh, called the Second Mile Giving List. The second, Second Mile Giving is about the generosity that, some, that, that folks can offer 
after support for the local congregation. And it's a way to express something, and I want to talk about what that, that something is. Just a little bit of mechanics. The session uh, has recently reviewed this second mile giving list, uh, updated it from a couple of years ago, and it is an ensemble of sort of prepared, vetted uh, causes and agencies, very specific ones, uh, that we are in a position to uh, legally pass donations from the congregation directly to these activities and organizations without any interference or anything at all. Every dollar that is donated to these causes goes directly uh, to, to those causes. These are hardly the only things that are worthy of our second mile giving, no question about that. But I'm particularly passionate about one of them. Down in the lower right corner, the PCUSA special offerings. And I'm particularly passionate about those offerings for one reason. Deb invited us in the sermon to tell us a little bit about what we believe, and I'm gonna do that this morning. Because I believe that this kind of giving is not about the money. Well, okay, yeah, it's a little bit about the money. But it is not nearly as much about the money as it is about expressing the theology of the Presbyterian Church, the theology that we share more or less in common, the theology that plays out in a world today a theology that plays out in the way we live and the way we interact with our neighbors. It's not quite so much a remote theology uh, about a kingdom uh, that we don't quite understand what a kingdom is. Um, I'm personally heartbroken about the war in the Ukraine. I'm heartbroken about the war in Gaza. And there's very little I can do about that. There's very, very little I can do about that. But I can do something about support for retired church workers, men and women who have devoted their lives to, 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 to the church and now need a little bit of financial support. I can do something about minority education. That's called the Christmas joy offering. I can do something about youth ministry and ministry to young adults. I was at the Synod meeting uh, earlier this week and heard about uh, some revitalization of the Young Adult Volunteers Program, and I can support that. I can do something about peacemaking offerings, people relating to other people in the way they live together. And I can do something about the things that are part of the One Great Hour sharing offering, the offering that is right among us here as we move into the, into the Easter season. The One Great Hour of sharing offering uh, supports three activities of the Presbyterian Mission Agency, the Presbyterian Disaster, uh, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, the Hunger Program, and self-development of people, and the slide talks about the things that those, that, that those activities do in the real world today in the kingdom of God as we live in it today. But I want to accent a little bit of something different. Presbyterian disaster assistance is about helping people, but it's about hope. It's really about hope. What happens after devastating disasters? What happens after people lose their home or their livelihood or their friends and neighbors? Presbyterian disaster assistance is about ministry in those areas, but it's also about the hope that comes behind. It's about the theology of hope. The Presbyterian hunger program. I'm firmly convinced that Jesus liked to eat. Jesus enjoyed eating and he enjoyed eating with other people. The, pr the provision of food, just simple food, is a theological statement. But the Presbyterian Hunger Program goes further than that. It is also a statement about the alleviation of poverty, the just use of resources um, around the world, and about stewardship of the planet. It's more than just about what I think is an incredibly 
uh, interesting tradition in the church, the least coin offering that Presbyterian women have taken for years and years. And self-development of people. Well, if you know me, you sometimes know I get a little bit critical about uh, the concept of, of uh, Western and especially American individualism. Well, people, individual people matter. And in many ways, helping people develop themselves, their own resources, their own way of living, their own culture, that's important too. And self-development of people says it in its title. So it's not about the money. The money's important. It's not about the money. I think it would be incredibly exciting if White Rock Presbyterian Church could say that a large fraction of our members and our, and our friends participated in the support of one great hour of sharing offering, not for the bucks. Well, maybe for the Starbucks. You know, for five bucks, for the, for the cost of one, one coffee at Starbucks, um, any one of us could put something in an envelope or write a check and designate it for the one great hour of sharing, not to make some coin, but to express a theology of support for those priorities and values for living in the world we live in today. So that's, what I, that's one of the things that I believe in. <laughs> if you will, let's join in um, hymn, 107, uh, hymn 605, it's the doxology. As we give our thanks, please listen to uh, the prayer, a prayer from John Wesley uh, written in his language and think about, about the thankfulness that we have to be able to give. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put to me what thou wilt, rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for thee or laid aside for thee. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine. So be it. Amen. So just a few reminders of ways that we can participate, anybody can participate in the life of this community of faith. One is to stay afterwards for treats and drinks and conversation in the room across the hall. We hope you'll all do that. Uh, I also wanna, this is the beginning of Holy Week. Today is the beginning of Holy Week. And so there are a multitude of services available to us in the community at large. Uh, those were listed in the overlook, the, the services affiliated with the churches that we have done the Lenten program with. Um, here at White Rock Presbyterian, there will be a service on Monday, Thursday, this Thursday at 7 p.m. All are invited to participate in that. Uh, there will be Good Friday services available in other places. Um, 
and I encourage all of us to participate in one or both of those as we are able. On Easter morning, next Sunday, there will be a sunrise, ecumenical sunrise service again at the Overlook at 645. Hopefully it will not be snowing or raining as it might have been this morning. Uh, there also will be one up at Ashley Pond, um, an, another ecumenical service. And then of course there will be a service here at 9.30 uh, and a light brunch following that that all are invited to stay for. Uh, so I hope, that, I hope that we have each have a blessed holy week uh, in anticipation of and preparation for the celebration of Easter next Sunday. I will invite you now to stand to receive a charge and I invite Jennifer to come up and you can do your thing there and I'll do my thing here. Blessed is the one who comes to us by the way of love poured out with abandon. May we receive that love freely. Blessed is the one who walks toward us by the way of grace that holds fast. May we remain in that grace resolutely. Blessed is the one who calls us to follow in the way of blessing in the path of joy. And may we follow in that path with courage, faith, and hope. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.
Hosanna, loud Hosanna, the little children sang. Through pillar, court, and temple, the lovely anthem rang. To Jesus, who had blessed them, close folded to his breast, the children sang their praise. The simplest and the best From all heaven they followed Among the joyful crowd The victory palm branch waving With praises clear and loud The may we ever praise Him With heart and life and voice Hosanna, loud Hosanna, the little children sang. Through pillar, court, and temple, the lovely anthem rang. Hosanna, loud Hosanna. The little children sang Through pillar, court, and temple The lovely anthem rang To Jesus who had blessed them Close folded to his breast The children sang their praises The simplest and the best from all heaven they followed Among the joyful crowd The victory palm branch waving With praises clear and loud The may we ever praise Him With heart and life and voice And in His blissful prayer Hosanna, loud Hosanna, the little children say.